Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for our re most recent Stack Chat. I'm Jack Tortoroli, the Executive in Residence and Head of Institutional Advancement at St. Thomas Aquinas College here in Rockland County in New York. And uh, I'm, uh, thank you for tuning in as well. And I really uh, am honored today to have Dr. Chatelain as our, as our guest. Um, Dr. Chatelain is a professor uh, and the provost, uh, provost professor of history and African studies at Georgetown University. She's the author of a number of books. The most recent, which will be most of the topic of our conversation today, is Franchise, The Golden Arches in the Black uh, Community and uh, in Black America, I should say, and we're uh, delighted to be able to talk about that and welcome uh, Dr. Shetland to, uh, to Stack Chats. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you, thank you. It's great for you to be here. So I wanted to start with, uh, you know, with the book and, um, and, and really the story of the book is about how capitalism can unify cohorts to serve its interests, even in a disagreeable community or as it disassembles communities. And I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Yes. So for many people, especially I think now is an excellent example, we have a lot of critiques of consumer culture. We have a lot of critiques of the ways that we're marketed products. And we know that sometimes the way that goods and services are delivered can be unethical or can create a lot of moral dilemmas. Mm -hmm. But there's also something deeply tantalizing and exciting about the consumer marketplace. And what I wanted to examine in franchise is the ways that communities have complicated relationships with fast food. Mm -hmm. I work on a lot of fast food history and people will tell me that it's not very healthy and you probably shouldn't get it. And there's all sorts of environmental factors that prop up the fast food industry. Yeah. And then they'll tell me about their favorite memory of going to McDonald's with their family. And so I really wanted to capture the ways that people are constrained under capitalism and how they also find ways to survive under it. Yeah, uh, that's, that's exciting. You know, it's funny, fast food is a topic because uh, when I worked at PepsiCo years ago, well, that's when we owned Taco Bell, KFC, oh, yeah. Pizza Hut, um, and you know, and, and McDonald's was the enemy anyway, but probably, mostly because they served Coke instead of Pepsi as well, but they competed with us. But so it is a fascinating uh, sort of industry and, and franchise or franchisee relationships and how that all comes together in the community. Um, and it, it's interesting too, on, on one of the pages, page 21 in your, in your book, you say something that I found fascinating I wanna to touch on with you. The contemporary health crisis among black America has a history. By unmasking the process of how that fast food became black, we are able to appreciate the difficult decisions black Americans had had to make under the stress of racial trauma, political exclusion, and social alienation. That's pretty powerful in what you say there. What, 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 what can you elaborate on that? What are you, what are you, what are you specifically thinking about and, and seeing in your, in your research for the book? One of the reasons I wrote this book is that I hear a lot of discourse, and especially with COVID-19, you hear this um, talk about being healthy. The Surgeon General says, you know, certain communities are predisposed to illnesses that we, try, we tie to poor nutrition. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. But one of the things that I think is often missing in that conversation are the politics and social conditions that make fast food a fixture in some communities more often than others. And what I wanted to really help people grasp is that there's nothing natural about fast food popping up in your community. There's no special affinity that one community will have for fast food. What there are are a set of choices often limited that are presented to people. And the introduction of fast food into African-American communities was often um, couched in this idea that this could be a vehicle for economic empowerment, for job creation, for yeah. all sorts of participation in a consumer uh, society that people really longed for. And yeah. so I think sometimes we have to make those distinctions to understand the complexity of how we change them. Right, right. Because while you may be creating employment in those communities, there are other health issues that, that arise as a, as a result of it. So, um, and, and do you think it disproportionately impacts African Americans versus other minorities? If I think about like in LA and, and you know, the, the large Hispanic or, or Mexican communities there, do you, do you see the same thing in, in other uh, ethnic groups as well, do you think? 
um, you see some similarities in terms of the proliferation of these restaurants in certain hyper segregated communities. Yep. Um, the distinction for African Americans is their communities were targeted first. Mm -hmm. And as demographic shifts happened in large urban areas and some working class suburbs, you see the audience is different. But a lot of this early intervention into non-white audiences was targeted toward African Americans. Right, right, sure. This is, on another page, page 76 of the book, um, you have a, a, a paragraph that says, if Nixon and Jackson, uh, and we're talking about Reverend Jackson here, um, disagreed on a million things, they could find common ground on the notion that economic development should be a key component in black visions of freedom. And I find that so imp impactful because at the end of the day, you know, it really is the economic disparity that creates where people reside and creates what they eat essentially in terms of availability and in terms of financial availability as well. So I was wondering, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you think about that in, in terms of, you know, how do we raise up the economic uh, sort of playing field so that it's, it's, it's more equally balanced and, and maybe therefore part of this, you know, the issues we're seeing in those communities, you know, would obviously be better off. Well, I think that when we think about racial justice and economic justice, we have to focus on the public sphere and the public good. Mm. One of the reasons I wrote this book is that I was increasingly concerned that we have an assumption that the corporate sector is the place where we should try to have our problems answered. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we turn our back on the public sphere, the public good, public services, a robust federal state that can provide for its citizens, then we might as well wave the white flag. And so one of the reasons why I think fast food was able to dominate in these communities is because they had been gutted economically, yeah. had long been under-resourced, the war on poverty was a glimmer within the the decade, and in its place came these incentives to bring in private corporations that said, we'll provide jobs, we'll provide community activities, we'll give scholarships to schools, but at the end of the day, a corporation is in the service of itself. Yeah. And as people in community, we're in service of helping each other. And so I think that if we really want to attack some of these economic inequality questions, the answer is make sure corporations are paying enough taxes, get a very large pot of resources and take care of everyday people. Yeah. Economic development plans are fine for the small percentage of people who open businesses and can invest, but yeah. most people won't have access to that. And so at the very bottom floor, we need to have good places to live, good schools to send children, care for our elderly, health care, sick leave, benefits that are not tied to our work, yeah. and then we can see what's possible in our society. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I hadn't really thought of it in that way before, but you hear so much now when I'm talking to CEOs and, and you know, what's going on in their businesses and, and how, you know, our college stack could, could be a part of the, you know, what they're doing in terms of their workforce needs, experiential learning and the like. You know, they, one of the first things they all say to me is, well, give us diverse candidates, right? We, we, so there's this whole corporate sort of thing around diversity and inclusion. But it, it, to your point, it's really not the answer to the problem. It could be, but it's not because of tax structures and different reasons. But at the end of the day, we don't talk enough about what, what local municipal governments are doing or state governments or county governments. And in fact, the federal government is doing because if you think about it, for me anyway, you can go back 50 years and today, and what's really changed? You know? Well, this is, this is what concerns me. And so I think what's fascinating is this idea that, um, you know, we're in another cycle of history where people feel like they're at this fork in the road for racial reckoning. And so what do we see? We see high level um, corporations doing diversity initiative. We, we see this deep desire to change the color of leadership. But as someone who, um, doesn't believe in trickle down economics, that same mindset that you just change a few leaders, you open up some avenues to opportunity, and that can be transformation is a real yeah. problem. Yeah. Because that's not how it works. We have to really start person by person and making sure people can get the things that they need. Yeah, and, and do you think this moment in time with what we're seeing with you know social injustice, racial injustice, do you think there may be a moment in time here where we might 
this might lead to more systemic and more, more hopeful change? Well, I think what we are benefiting from is a generation of um, people who are entering the public sphere from a different perspective. So we see folks who were activists in Ferguson, Missouri, people who were very much inspired by the movement for Black Lives, and they've done the kind of on the ground organizing that's so essential, and now they're running for Congress. They're running in the local level. And so I think that these avenues to elective service are so important, but I also think the fact that, you know, we are just in this calamitous moment where I think people are really relying on their imagination to think of different ways to solve problems. And so I'm hopeful that as leadership is being groomed and cultivated for this moment, that they have a kind of a broader vision of what's possible because they see the kind of failures in the past and they want to create movements that are sustainable. Yeah, I have, uh, I have three children who are now adults. My youngest is 30 years old, so I shouldn't really call them children, but they'll always be children, I suppose. But you know, and, and, and uh, in this case, my son has been out, you know, in the demonstrations in New York City, you know, and really is passionate about the cause. And I've said to him, that's great, but, you know, why don't you just run for office, make the change you want to see, you know, get involved. And I, I do think there's a passion, you know, in that age sort of cohort that really wants to try to do something that, that could be a change from what it is, rather than just you know, taking the moment, protesting and going back as if, right, your job or, or whatever you're doing is, is, is nothing's changed. So, you know, I wanted to touch on as well, because I, I also think it's fascinating that in the franchise world, particularly in some of the inner cities, you know, there's been a, a, been a concerted effort to try to get Blacks as franchisees to own the franchises. And, and as you describe in the book, that in itself itself creates a tension within the community. And I was hoping you could, might share some more thoughts on that with us. Yes, so uh, starting in 1968, McDonald's and then other brands followed soon after started recruiting African Americans to become franchise owners. And one of the things that happens as a result is that you start to see franchise owners taking on kind of an unelected role in the community. And this is very common for African American business people who are often mediating conflicts, they're negotiating deals on behalf of the broader community. Some are becoming very wealthy and so they are in the position to create philanthropy in the community. So it's working on that level. But one of the things that I think is really illustrative about how race and class can work together is that even within a system that is able to produce a lot of very wealthy African Americans, African American franchise owners are still at a disadvantage relative to their white peers. Mm -hmm. And there's been some recent reporting about how McDonald's is actually losing a lot of black franchise owners because on average they're making about $68,000 less per month mm -hmm. than white franchise owners. Mm -hmm. There's still concerns about them being hyper segregated in certain communities. Mm -hmm. There are all of these ways in which franchising, strangely enough, mirrors a lot of the racial discrimination that we assign to the real estate sector. Mm -hmm. So people are having a hard time getting loans. They are being steered towards certain communities. They find that the expense of having their businesses is higher because of the communities they're in. And so I think there's a deep poignancy that when we think about how hard it is for some people to kind of break that glass ceiling and get an entryway into certain types of businesses, they still are contending with the ways that race shapes and limits opportunities. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, just simply by the geography of where they want the franchisee to be, right, based on the, the color of their skin. It's, um, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Dr. Shetland, how, how, what, you know, coming, bringing back to your, you're a Georgetown, you know, I'm in, in, uh, in, in stack here. Um, what could higher education do better um, to address the issues that you've, you've laid out in, in your book and, and, um, you know, and make, make our students as graduates, you know, go into society with, with, with a different mindset to, to the issues that, that you call out in the book? Well, there's so much we can do. First of all, I think higher education, whether it's private schools or public schools, they have to be good citizens in their communities. Mm -hmm. So they've got to think about the issue of how they police campuses. They've got to think about how welcoming they are to folks who aren't just the students. They yeah. have to think about um, how to expand with uh, a mind towards justice to reduce things like gentrification. You know, we often think of universities as just providing 
100% benevolence and good in a community because it's a place where people learn and grow, which is true, but they're also businesses. And when we think about the placement of stadiums, the placement of hospitals, the impact of off-campus students on local rents and local communities, we understand that universities are powerful actors in many ways and that they have the capacity to actually set an example of how to exist in on the local level mm -hmm. and then it's how they pay workers how they treat workers the types of businesses they contract with and i think when you create an environment of justice mm -hmm. and your students observe it yeah. they they know if the workers are striking because sometimes they're leading those strikes with the workers yeah. you know and so i think you create an environment of justice and then you infuse the curriculum with a broad and deep desire for the truth i think that you um you get over traditions, you're willing to revise, and you're willing to revisit issues about your institution because you know that it mirrors the process of intellectual inquiry and discovery and leadership. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at, at Stack here, our second largest major by enrollment is criminal justice. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, we have a relationship with a correctional facility just north of us where we're going into the college and into the, uh, the facility and we're, we're teaching uh, students, incarcerated individuals, you know, we're giving them a chance for an undergraduate degree. This year we're going to be doing an, M an MBA, MPA, excuse me, for, for those incarcerated folks. And then we're, we're partnering with an organization here in the area that helps uh, facilitate or ease the re-entry for incarcerated people as they come out and rejoin society. So, you know, social justice, i.e. criminal justice for us anyway, has been a big part of the fabric of you know what we do and what we're proud of here and and you know over the last several months with everything going on around us we've really doubled down on on making sure that we're sensitive to you know the the inequalities that we see in the in society today and and, and making sure that as an organization as a community you know we're we're, we're addressing it and, uh, and i'm pretty proud of of the fact that we're really stepping up and doing that not that we haven't in the past i think because of our heritage as a dominican founded by dominican sisters you know, we've always been passionate about people and the individual. And we're small enough where, where all the students are a name and a face as opposed to, you know, just a, a sea of people in a class, you know, as we know in other institutions. Well, I, I worry a little bit, and I'm curious on your thoughts about with everything going on now with remote learning and, and, and the implications of the pandemic, I fear in the, in the, and again, going back to the inner city model that you talk about in the book, or, I fear that there's potentially a cohort that could get left behind um, mm -hmm. because they don't have access to broadband or the devices, or you know, there's five kids at home and there's only one device and the parent. Um, what could we, or in this case, you know, companies do better, you, you think, to, to step in early because getting them at college is one thing, but stepping in early to really help them, you know, like my brother's keeper um, under the Obama Foundation does, you know, what else could we be doing for the black community in, in these times to help education, particularly in the younger, younger kids as they go through? I would say pay more taxes. Yeah. In immediate, right? In the immediate, I want the tech companies to give every kid a computer. I want the utilities to be deregulated so broadband can be super, super accessible. That's the short-term solution. And then after you do that, I want you to pay more taxes. Mm -hmm. Because once we have more public goods and services to provide quality housing, quality education, quality health care, then we don't, we don't need philanthropy anymore, right? right? Philanthropy is coming in where civil society has failed people. Right. And so, you know, and it's doing it for a lot cheap and it's being really selective on its terms. So, you know, I think it's, I think it's amazing when people are giving out of a, a sense of generosity, but I'm more impressed by the person who's making, you know, $15 an hour and who's putting $5 in the basket at mass yeah. every week. Right. That, that is philanthropy to me. Right. But if you're making billions of dollars a day and you give a billion dollars to a college, that's a tip. You know, right. and so I think that there's some immediate needs, right? So we have to not just do the donor thing, then you use the influence of your higher educational institution and your company to force every school district in America to allocate funds to make sure every kid has a device, right? Like that is actual work. And I think that this is why the fast food industry creates such a moral conundrum in certain communities because they do give a lot. Right. They have contributed. 
but they do it at a very, very high price. And the people who feel the price are the workers and the folks who don't have tons of food options for whichever reasons and have to consume this product. That's right. And then, of course, you know, with the other debate that's going on is, is public spending, you know, the whole defund the police uh, conversations. But the allocation of the money that municipalities have already and making sure that there's a lens through which money disbursements are prioritized around education or around health care is, again, a whole other conversation that seems to just go on and on and on and, and nothing really tangibly transformative comes out of it. So that's just another frustration that's out there in terms of how, how everybody's dealing with this government, you know, uh, taxpayers, corporations, and the like. So, uh, so it's fascinating. I, I enjoyed so much the book, uh, Dr. Chatlin, and, and I wish you all success with it. And I tell you, we, we have created a social justice forum uh, here at the college. And I would love it at some point if we could invite you through a Zoom meeting to, I would love to join. share some of your thoughts with our student body and, and our guests. So uh, I would look forward to that very much. Chalin, thank you so much for your time. You. Uh, this has been great. And, uh, and again, thank you for sharing your time with us. And for everybody tuning in, thank you for uh, listening and watching.